Actually, that is the fan takeoff point for the ten different times that the Jews rebelled against God in their wilderness wanderings. And this very first incident sets for us the stage and gives to us the key principle that was behind every one of the ten rebellions. It's sort of the crux, the heart from which the ten rebellions spring, but they all come back to one thing. And the Lord willing, we'll be looking at that today. And the reason we've spent so long on looking at these issues in the ten rebellions is because they, as well as other things, but in particular, and mentioned specifically in the New Testament, these things are given as examples for us in the church so that we would not fall into the same kind of sins into which Israel fell. Paul writing in 1 Corinthians 10 says, and you've heard me read this at least four times now, I'm reading it again. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, so we're at the Exodus, and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and did all eat the same spiritual meat, they all ate manna, and did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. They all had equal benefits. In any given church, all the benefits are available for all who will take them. Though some decide to skip out and not take them. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. I guess you could say that. He wasn't well pleased when he killed them. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. God not only killed them, but he'll also kill people, wicked people who defile the church. And that's specifically what Paul taught in 1 Corinthians 5, just five chapters before this. Verse 6. Now these things were our examples to the intent, God had a purpose, that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, that's the golden calf failure. As were some of them, as it is written, and this is quoting uh, Numbers chapter 32 where this sin took place. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. That's the golden calf. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Paul tells us there how many God killed. The Levites killed three thousand. God killed twenty thousand. So we want to finish Rebellion Test 5, which is the golden calf. Just a few quick reminders. The first thing we learned about the golden calf dealt with impatience, a serious example for us today. There were three key principles. Patience is absolutely essential to the victorious Christian life. Impatience always leads to rebelling against the will of God and landing in carnal sin. And patience has two sides. First, it means you not only refrain from your natural impulses, well, but it was a natural thing to do. You refrain from that, but second, it means 
that with patience you are examining which option is available that fits biblical principles and you choose based on what scripture says you can do and what scripture says you cannot do. We contrasted patience with sloth. Genuine patience is not sloth for three reasons. First, because the Bible sets patience in contrast to sloth. Second, because patience must be exercised by faith to obtain the promises of God, and walking by faith is never sloth. And third, God not only commands patience, but he actively does things in our lives to develop patience. He always uses suffering and difficulty to develop patience. God's the one that brings those things into our life so that he will develop that fruit in us. The second major lesson we learned from the golden calf is that compromising leadership always bends to politically correct pressure. The third thing we learned from the golden calf is that people always support bad leadership and bad theology financially if it gives them a feel-good experience. The fourth thing we learned from the golden calf is that weak religious leaders will change their theology for cash. And to do that, of course, they have to sanctify sin. And we, we talked about the eight-step process, and I'll not repeat that here, how apostate religious leaders change their theology to sanctify sin. We saw that God offered to kill all the Jews and start over with Moses, and that's, an apostate would have loved that. But Moses said no because he was concerned about God's reputation rather than his own money and power. Moses used three arguments why God should not kill everybody but only the sex offenders. Number one, God was the one who delivered the Jews from Egypt. He declared to the people that he would and was able to bring them to the promised land. So if he killed them all and started over with Moses, he wouldn't keep that promise. Number two, pagans would badmouth God if he annihilated the Jews. So why should God give the pagans a reason to blaspheme his name? And third, if God killed everybody, it would be inconsistent with the covenant promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that would mean that God was either a liar or was incompetent or was impotent. Now, last week we began looking at prayer principles. Prayer principles that tie specifically in with this instance of the golden calf. Moses' petition not to kill all the people is a prayer principle that's found all over the Bible. You can always pray correctly applied principles that God has given to you in his word if they are given to you and not to somebody else. God never violates his word, but you've got to make sure that you know his word and whether or not the promise that you're reading in his word is something that applies to you. Look at the context. Look at to whom it was spoken. Look at the timing of the promise and when it will take place. And I gave the illustration of Psalm 2.8, which has nothing to do with the church age. It has to do with the second coming of Christ, where he comes back and breaks the nations with a rod of iron. The Father gives the Son the nations. Ask of me an inheritance. The heath, I will give thee the heathen of the inheritance in the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession, and thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. That's not a promise to you. It's not a missionary verse. So when you want God to answer a prayer based on a promise that he has made, you can only claim a promise that has been given to you and not to somebody else or some other group. Second, you must always apply the promise in the correct context. In other words, there may be some requirements or stipulations that God has attached to the promise if you're going to receive it. You can't just say, well, God, you promised this. God says, did you read the rest of the verse? Did you read the verse before it? Did you read the verse after it? I gave some requirements. I gave some stipulations for receiving this promise. If you ignore the stipulations, don't complain when God says no. And you can't complain back and say, but God, you promised. He says, I promised with stipulations. Like the dad who promises his kid, you know, if you mow the lawn, I will give you an ice cream cone. And the kid only pays attention to the second half. And he says to his father, where's my ice cream cone? Father says, what do you mean? You promised to give me an ice cream cone. Didn't you promise? Yes, I did. Did you do what I told you to do? 
Uh, what'd you tell me to do? Mow the lawn. But I want the ice cream cone now. It's hot. I want it before I mow the lawn. No. You don't get it until after you mow the lawn. Make sure that when you're claiming a promise from God, that it is a promise given to you and that it is a promise which, if it has stipulations, you obey. Otherwise, the answer from God will always be no. God always answers prayers with yes that are prayed according to the promises of his word. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Now, where did God reveal his will? God doesn't give you special revelation. He doesn't give you a bolt of blue whereby suddenly flashing across the sky, written by angel fires, is the will of God for you. That doesn't happen. God gives you his word and he expects you to obey it. It's not just a matter of reading his word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's the word proclaimed that develops the faith to obey. Not merely for the moment of salvation, but all through the Christian life. That's why we're exhorted not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhort one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The closer we get to the return of Christ, the more you ought to be in church. Every time you miss a service, you are missing God's word for you. That's serious business because you don't have that much longer to live. It's not going to be that long until Jesus comes back. You might die. I might die in the middle of this service. I hope you understand that. Christ might come back before the message is over. I hope he does. I'm ready to go. Prayer. Pray things according to his word. If we ask anything according to his will, which is revealed in his word, and through the proclamation of his word, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, now, whatsoever we ask, what is that modified by in the first verse? Whatsoever we ask, God, you said, whatsoever I ask, you'll hear me. Wait a minute. What did we just finish reading in the preceding verse? If we ask anything according to his will. You've got to ask requests that are according to his will. And that's what modifies. He will hear us, whatever we ask. We know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. But you've got to start with verse 14 and you can't cut it out. That's why a lot of times we get no answers to our prayers. That brought us to a discussion of how our text applies to the sin unto death and how that applies to the church. There are three more startling statements in the context that tie in with our text in Exodus. Number one, the sin unto death. God was killing people, you remember there, in the Old Testament, but he only ended up killing people that committed the sex sins. And you know clearly from the New Testament that God still kills people for sex sins. Believers, that is. Though he gives diseases to unbelievers too who insist on violating his righteous standards. Number two, the connection to petitions and prayers. The Bible talks about who should we pray for and who should we not pray pray for there are some sinning Christians who have been warned that you no longer pray for them 1st John chapter 5 remember we've just been reading out of 1st John 5 14 and 15 what's the very next thing after these prayer request promises we just read if we ask anything according to his will he hears us and we know that whatsoever we ask oh if whatsoever we ask according to his will that we have the petitions that we desired of him and the very next verse says 
If any man see his brother sin a sin, so you're going to know it. It's a sin that you know about. There are some things that you don't know about yet, but the ones that you do know about. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death. Ah. So that implies that there are some sins that are not unto death, and there are some sins that are unto death. He'll expound on that a little bit later in the next verse. If he sees a brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask. Now remember, what did we just read here? Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. So now you're praying in this context for a brother who has sinned a sin that is not unto death. And he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Did you know there's a verse in Romans chapter 3 that says the wages of sin is what? Death. Did you know that any sin you do, any of them, has the possibility of leading to your death. That should make me, I hope you too, shudder in my boots. Because sin separates you from God. Oh, you say, but I'm saved. I got a permanent connection. Yeah, you do. But your fellowship can be broken. And if you insist on your sin, the chastening hand of the Father will come down hard on you if you're a believer. If you never experience chastening, it means you're not saved even if you think you are. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receiveth. If ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. You're illegitimate. You're a pretender. Just remember, we all stand at the brink of death every moment of every day. We have all sinned. We have forgiveness through the blood of Christ. When we sin after salvation, we're out of fellowship and we're under the impending hand of the spanking Father. But we do have forgiveness and cleansing when we confess our sins and turn from them and repent and don't do like the Catholics. And we go to confessional and the Father, quote Father, says that your sins are absolved and we go out and we do it again. the sin unto death. There comes a point when the rest of the church, seeing your sin, says, it's time to stop praying for that person. And God uses the final instrument of chastening, whereby you turn such a one over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Sin unto death. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask. Remember, we've just been talking about asking things according to his will. His will is revealed in his word. So his word is gonna to reveal to us and help us understand what it is when we're praying for a brother who is sinning. Don't miss the context. 
Well, there's some general principles there too, but don't miss the context. And he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Just remember, every one of us has one foot in the grave and one foot on a banana peel. And you have brothers and sisters who are praying for you. And they're praying that God will hold on to you and that he'll pull you back from the pit of death. Do you pray for the other people in this church that way? You perceive that there may be sin in this man, this woman, this boy, this girl. And do you begin to pray for them? God, bring them to repentance, bring them to repentance, bring them to repentance. Because they haven't sinned unto death yet. And he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Now look at the last part. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. That's somebody you stop praying for. Do you know how important it is for the rest of the body of Christ to be praying for you? To pray a hedge of protection around you? Those of you who are parents know how important it is to pray a hedge of protection around your children. And if you're older, to pray a hedge of protection around your grandchildren and to do it every day and to bring them before the throne of grace. Do you remember the book of Job? How he prayed and prayed for his children in case they had committed sin and Satan hated it. And Satan was determined to do some bloody murders. He was determined to get that man who prayed. That man who trusted God and he killed Job's children. And he killed his servants and he stole all of his cattle and camels and everything that he had. And with the permission of God, he smote Job with boils from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. <laughs> but he left Job's wife. She's the kind of wife no man wants to have. Reminder, men, you can be godly men even if you've got a wife like Job's wife. Because she said, curse God and die. Oh, great. She'd rather have her husband dead. And the way he goes out is he curses God. What's wrong with that picture? What's wrong with that woman? A lot of bad things can happen in life, folks. All unrighteousness, verse 17. All unrighteousness is sin. And there is a sin not unto death. In other words, you don't, oh, I just caught him in sin. I'm going to quit praying for him. No, you pray for those except those people who stubbornly, after they have been confronted with their sin, insist on continuing in sin. And they wave and mockingly say, let us sin that grace may abound. And Paul says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer there? And you can't continue living in sin and get away with it if you're a believer. If you get away with it, it means you're not saved, you're on your way to hell anyway. 
Because once the believers remove the prayer shield, the chastening hand of God will come upon you. And you will feel the wrath of the Father. And the end of that is death. He takes you off the field because you're playing for the other team. The third statement by John ties us directly back to the golden calf. And that's the last verse. I think I mentioned this before. Right there in 1 John chapter 5, 14, 15, 16, and 17, we jump down just two more, three verses more. The very last verse in 1 John ties us back directly to the golden calf. They had committed a sin unto death. God told the Levites, go kill them. The Levites killed 3,000. God brought a plague on them. God killed 20,000 more. Last verse in John, 1 John. And John covers all the basic principles that we're studying in Exodus in this final epistle in the very last chapter, very last verse. He covers the golden calf principle in the very last thing that John warns against. And he warns believers against. And he warns good believers against is the sin of the golden calf just before he writes the book of Revelation. 1 John 5, 21. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Do you have any idols in your life? Covetousness is idolatry. The covetous man is an idolater. Colossians 3 5, Ephesians 5 5, if you don't believe me. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father but is of the world. John has written that earlier in his first epistle. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away. And the lusts thereof, I don't care what you look at here in this world, it's on its way out. Exit stage left. But he that doeth the will of God. What were we just reading about here? He that doeth the will of God gets his prayers answered. There is no mistake when John uses that same phrase about chucking the things of the world out the window. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. World temporal, will of God eternal. Prayer requests always get a yes answer if prayed according to his will. His will is revealed in his word. This is not rocket science, folks. But there are a lot of Christians who ignore it. They run the stop signs. They refuse to go when the light turns green. And they cause a lot of wreckage along the way. He that doeth the will of God, the will revealed in the word. The one who prays according to the will of God gets yes answers to his prayer requests. The golden calf applies today. Now, last week we began looking <clears throat> at Moses' response and his actions over in Exodus 32. Moses turned and went down from the mountain. The two tables of the testimony were in his hand, and the tables were written on both their sides, on the one side and on the other. They were written, and the tables were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God graven upon the tables. 
And when Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said unto Moses, there's a war of noise of war in the camp. And he said, it's not the voice of them that shout for mastery, neither is it the voice of them that cry for being overcome, but the noise of them that do sing, I hear. And it came to pass, as soon as he came nigh to the camp, that he saw the calf and the dancing. And Moses' anger waxed hot, and he cast the tables out of his hands, and he brake them beneath the mount, and he took the calf which they had made, and burned it in the fire, and grabbed the powder, and started it upon the water, and made the children of Israel to drink it. We talked about all that last week. You'll have to remember what was in that sermon. And Moses said unto Aaron, What did this people unto thee that thou hast brought so great a sin upon them? And Moses said, Let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. Oh, you know, you know, don't get hot under the collar. It's not all that bad. You know the people. I mean, hey, look, this is just standard procedure. Uh, they're set on mischief. Mischief. Mischief? I mean, mischief, we're talking about kids egging people's houses on Halloween. This is a lot more than mischief. For they said unto me, Make us gods which shall go before us, for as for this Moses, <laughs> Moses, whoever he is, the, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. Who cares? When was the last time he did something for us? Talk about ingratitude. And I said unto them, Whosoever hath any gold, let them break it off. So they gave it to me, and I cast it into the fire, and it came out this calf. Yeah, wobble, wobble, out of the fire. And when Moses saw the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies, then Moses stood at the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together unto him. Now we start verse 27 today. And he said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Put every man his sword by his side, and go in and out from gate to gate throughout the camp. In other words, don't miss anybody. He'll make it systematic. Start at the gates. And move your way through the camp. Every place you go, flip open the tent. Flip open the tent. Flip open the tent. Flip open the tent. What's going on inside? What's going on inside? You're going to go look. And slay every man his brother, and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. No favorites. You don't cut anybody any slack. It should be self-evident, but it's obviously quite obvious that God is capable of doing anything by himself without our help. In this case, God was quite capable of killing people because while the Levites were killing brothers and sons, next verse, verse 29, tells us they had to kill their sons too if the sons were involved in this. And their companions, that is, their good friends, and Joe, don't worry about me. Go get somebody else. I'm your best friend. Oh, oh don't kill me. I'm, I'm your neighbor. You know, we live next door to each other and we, we talk across the fence. We've had some barbecues together. 3,000. Of course, God killed a lot more over the 40 years in the wilderness, but he also killed 20,000 here. And the children of Levi did, according to the word of Moses, and there fell to the people that day about 3,000 men. For Moses had said, now listen to what Moses said. Why did they do it? They had to do something first. Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord. You know, God expects you to participate in things. God can do it all by himself. He doesn't need you. But he is determined to find out in the congregation who is committed to him. Who is consecrated to him. And then he will put you to a test where you have to do something that either you're afraid to do or you think may be repulsive for you to do because after all what the Bible requires you to do might make you embarrassed in front of somebody else it might make you have to identify with a position that is not politically correct 
It might put you in a situation, remember, all the camp of Israel were armed. And if somebody saw the Levites coming, he could have figured out, I'm going to defend myself. God expects you to participate. It's not always the same participation, but when he calls the church to do something, he expects everybody to consecrate themselves to the service of God and to be involved. Last week I gave you a little phrase. When was the last time you showed up for work? God's work. Look at this. Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord. Even every man, here he mentions the sons, even every man upon his son and upon his brother. He'd already talked about brothers and companions and neighbors, but verse 29 he talks about sons. I have eight sons. I can hardly imagine what it would be like if I would have been in the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness and I've tried to raise my sons to fear God, although being in the congregation probably would have meant that I wasn't a very good example, but raised my sons to serve God. These are Levites who have stood with Moses, which means their sons are Levites. Their brothers are Levites, but apparently not every Levite showed up. I can hardly imagine what it would be like for God to tell me, go in the camp, and if you see your son, Ariel, or Philemon, or Nehemiah, or Hillary, or Elijah, Sebastian, Isaiah, Anatoly, if you see even one of them involved in fornication, you've got to go kill him. Dear people, do you understand what consecration means? The depth of consecration that God requires? If he required that of Levites, now you living post-cross, how much greater is the level of consecration that he expects from you? who have been cleansed by the blood of Christ. Consecration for participation. Look at the last phrase. You do it every man upon his son, his brother. Look at the last phrase. That he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. We all want the blessing of God. I doubt if there's even one person in this auditorium or in the listening audience that does not want the blessing of God. Moses says, consecrate yourselves this day. You're going to do a job. You're going to have to do it thoroughly. You're going to have to do it on the people you love most. If you want God's blessing... In other words, if you want the blessing of God, you may have to deal brutally with sin, even if it's in the context of your own family. Moses was not afraid to tell the people that they had sinned. Many modern wimpy preachers never talk about the sins that are in their own congregations. They only talk about the sins that other churches are doing, like how bad it is that Catholics worship Mary. We all, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Bad sin, bad sin, bad sin. 
oh, that, that blasphemous thing of the, you know, where they think the host turns into Jesus, you know, and, and they offer the only true and living God, and they think they're eating Jesus and drinking Jesus' blood. Oh, yeah, it's easiest to criticize that. But we never talk about our own sins. Notice something else here in the text. Moses offers sacrifices of atonement now. Atonement for sin. That's not like the sacrifices they offered before. Remember, we talked about that. The sacrifices that were submission offerings and fellowship offerings. The Jews had offered those things in front of the golden calf. But now it says, on the morrow, verse 30, it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said unto the people, Ye have sinned. Well, it wasn't too bad because it's only one little, little golden calf here. You know, let's just get rid of the golden calf and everything will be cool. Ye have sinned a great sin. Did you know? God has levels of sin. Oh, maybe that's why there's a sin unto death and there's a sin that is not unto death. Ye have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. And now I will go up unto the Lord for adventure. I shall make an atonement for your sin. It's a sin offering. You know, in spite of all that, it's amazing. Moses, Moses was an incredible man. I mean, talk about a man of character. He had weaknesses, you know, no doubt, no question. But he had incredible courage. He had incredible humility. He had incredible love for this rascal bunch of people. Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, he's saying, please, please forgive their sin. But, but if you won't do it, God, blot I pray thee out of thy book which thou hast written. Moses is willing to give up not just his physical life, but the book that is written is the book of life eternal. He's willing to give up what we call salvation for the sake of the Jewish people. Do you love anybody that much? You think about it. Would you be willing to give up eternity in the joyful eternity in the presence of God? Would you be willing to suffer hell so that six million people could go to heaven? Minimum six million. Would you be willing to suffer eternal hell if you could give up your own salvation and every Jew and every Christian too because there were six million Christians murdered in the Holocaust but every Jew in the Holocaust would trust Jesus and be saved? Would you do that? I don't think I could do that. That tells you something about Moses. What an incredible great man he was. Did you hear what he said? Now if thou will forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book, which thou hast written. Don't miss things like that in the text, dear ones. Here's a man in extremis. He's come as far as he can. He's standing between God and the people. And God says, I'm going to kill them all. I'm going to make you the new one. And Moses says, no, kill me instead. Spare the people. Blot me out. I don't think I would have done that. Would you have done that? How much do you love the other people in this church? How much do you love all the rest of the Bible Presbyterians scattered around the world? Let's just talk about Bible Presbyterians for a minute. If God said, I am sick and tired of Bible Presbyterians, 
I'm going to get rid of them all, and I'm going to make you the new leader. And people are going to throng to follow you. Oh man, it's going to be so great, and we'll have real Bible, Bible Presbyterians. But I'm going to wipe out all the rest of them. Would you stand in the gap and say, no, Lord, forgive them. And if not, blot me out of thy book which thou hast written. That's love. That's the character of Christ. That's the extreme to which Jesus went when he bore our sins and descended into hell and bore the wrath of the Father. I read this passage and I weep because I know how bad I am. But God reinstates a basic principle of blessing and judgment in verse 23. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever hath sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. When the Bible says the wages of sin is death, it's not merely talking about physical death. It's talking about spiritual death, and it's talking about the second death, which is the lake of fire. After judgment, God moves forward. He's basically saying, quit thinking about the past and start obeying. Verse 24, therefore now, to Moses, go, lead the people unto the place which I have spoken unto thee. In other words, we're moving forward. We've had an incident. We've had some sin. We've had some judgment. It is time to move forward. You've got to deal with the sin, but you can't sit and feel sorry about it. You can't sit and fiddle your thumbs. You can't sit and mumble and grumble. God says, now go. We've taken care of this. Now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken unto thee. And you don't have to go alone. Did you know you're not going to know how to get there? Look what it says. Behold, mine angel, my messenger, shall go before thee. Do you think God makes the way plain for us today? Mm-hmm. And someday we'll look back and we'll look at all the tight situations he got us through and we didn't even know it. All the times he spared our lives. All the times we avoided something that otherwise might have happened to us. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Peter talks about the day of visitation. It's coming. The conclusion statement is that God killed more people in addition to those that the Levites killed. And we see from the writings of the Apostle Paul, that, that uh, writings of John, that was 20,000. People suffer when their leaders sin. This is obvious in national scenarios. We all know about those kind of scenarios when bad leaders, for example, go to war. You know, Hitler decided to go to war. And the German people suffered. When bad leaders do bad things, the people suffer. Paul Pot, Mao Zedong, you know, Stalin and Lenin, and you can name them all over, the, all over the board. The people suffer. But that's true also in spiritual scenarios. Verse 35, And the Lord plagued the people because they made the calf which Aaron made. They participated, they gave their earrings. Aaron made it, but the people suffered. Wicked leadership always brings the judgment of God on the people. That brings us next week, the Lord willing, to the burning at Taborah in Numbers chapter 11, which is test number six. When the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. And the people cried unto Moses, and when Moses prayed unto the Lord, the fire was quenched. He called the name of the place Taborah, because the fire of the Lord burnt 
among them, and you've probably been paying attention to fires burning out on the West Coast. The worst season of fires, the most acreage ever burnt in U.S. history in a single spat of fires. We'll pick that one up next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power. Your word is quick. It's very fast. Very fast. It's sharp. Very sharp. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. No matter which way it goes, it cuts. It doesn't bang part of the time and cut part of the time. Oh, it's got a point, too. It pierces. Even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. That's in the spiritual. And the joints in the marrow. Oh, in the physical realm, too. Judgments do come in the physical realm. The children of Israel learned that. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart, not just the things that fly through, but the purposes that we have in the things that we do. What are we trying to accomplish by those little gestures, the little things that we do? Are we trying to get someone else to compromise? Are we trying to get someone else to fall into sin? Are we trying to indulge the flesh? Is it a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart? Father, we pray that you will take your word as proclaimed this day and that you will magnify your word. You will magnify your word above all your name. And that your word will penetrate our hearts and bring us to repentance and a confession of sin. That we might understand that there is a sin that is not unto death, but there is a sin that is unto death. And the congregation isn't even supposed to pray for it. Help us to realize that every sin might put us on the very brink of the grave. and cause us to be a people who are a committed people. A people who are a dedicated people. A people who are like the Levites, who have consecrated themselves to the Lord in his service, that we might be a useful people. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is hymn number 621, Tell Me the Old, Old Story. Let's